Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Montani. I'm a senior director of admissions here at Wilson College. Um, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to our next academic spotlight. Um, today we're going back to the integrated sciences and talking about STEM pre-professional programs. And that's something that I know when you're looking around now, um, you know, it's funny, you're thinking about the four years, of course, that you're going to be doing your undergrad. Um, and the idea that even that seems a little bit far out, that's a big thing to think about. And then going, okay, and then what happens after that? Um, you know, that's, that's an even bigger idea to start contemplating what you want to do. Um, but those of you, of course, here today, who've already started thinking about that a little bit, have an idea of where you want to go and realize it's going to take more than, of course, just four years. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to, you know, have our faculty um, who advise students every day. And of course, you know, some of our recent graduates who are actually out there doing those things that you're going to be doing after those four years, you know, tell you a little bit about what Wilson can offer in those experiences. Um, so before I turn it over to everybody there, um, I just want to remind everybody, please keep your audio and video off. Um, we are recording this session, so we don't want anybody but the presenters to appear on camera. And uh, you can use the chat function to send questions directly to me, because um, we will be doing a quick Q&A after the presentation is done. Um, but again, thank you for joining us. And with all of that, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Herriger to get us started. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, and, and welcome everyone to, to this session. Um, my name is Dana Herriger. I'm a professor of biology here at Wilson. Um, I've been here almost 25 years. Um, I come out of a liberal arts tradition. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Integrated Sciences Division here at Wilson. Um, and so if I can have uh, Deb Austin, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm Deb Austin. Um, I'm a professor of chemistry. I just finished my 34th year at Wilson. And um, I am also the Associate Dean of Academic Advising. So you'll definitely be hearing from um, both myself and the registrar uh, this summer. So look out for those uh, emails. And, and we also have two um, Wilson alums. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves as well. Um, one just graduated on Sunday. So congratulations to Logan and, and Zach. Um, graduated a year ago. So um, Logan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. So like you said, I just graduated this past Sunday and I'll be heading to Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine this coming August to start vet school. Great. Zach? Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Zach McMaster and uh, I'm a Wilson College alum. Um, I majored in bio biology and exercise science and I'm in my third trimester of chiropractic school at uh, NYCC. Great. Uh, we may have another person joining us. Um, he's currently in medical school and as we are speaking, he is involved in a clinical ro rotation right now. So as soon as his clinic is over, he's going to try to zoom in with us as well. So um, that depends on his patient load. Um, and he has nine months before he graduates from medical school. So um, we'll be ho ho hopefully he'll be able to join us here. So um, a little bit about Wilson College. So um, I'm glad that you've expressed an interest in us here at Wilson. It's a great time to be at Wilson. It's exciting. Um, we are a liberal arts college um, co-ed. I think one of the big things, I think for us as faculty, and I'm hoping the students as well, is we, we try to be as student focused as possible. And I hope that through this presentation today, um, you can see how we can work with you um, along that journey that, that you um, want to pursue, what your passion might be. So um, I'm not sure how many people have been to Wilson College. Um, we're located in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we've had a, a lot of infrastructure changes. The campus has transformed dramatically since I've been, since I started and even more recently in the past few years. Um, and so it is an historic village. Um, we're on the National Historic Registry um, for a lot of our original buildings. And then the new construction um, ties in with the older architecture. So this is our main green down here at the bottom. This is where our older buildings, they're not old, I mean, they're old, but they're newer inside. They've been renovated. Um, and this is uh, the back side of the original library. And this is Warfield over here. This is one of our academic buildings. Um, and so this is what the campus looks like. We have over 300 acres uh, of campus. Um, the majority of the campus, though, is along this blue line down here. Um, 
These are all the residence halls here. Um, this is the main green, and then this is the academic quad. And so this is where the Learning Commons Library is located. This is an academic building war field. This big Star Wars H building here. Um, this is the Brooks Science Complex. Um, and this new building right here, that's right here, this is the new Veterinary Education Center. I'll show you that in a minute. And then this building right here is the, um, where the arts are located. So we're primarily the academics are right in this area here. Um, and then everything over here, the equestrian center, our USDA organic certified farm is over here. Um, and our athletic fields sit up on the hill and, and down here. So um, we're separated by a creek. Um, so the campus is divided in, in half almost by the, by the water, but it provides a great um, research opportunity for us in our classes and just for um, for students to enjoy I think with the with the creek being there. Um, this is our new learning comment. So this part is the original library. This was built in the 1920s um, and then they totally gutted the interior of that building. This is what it looks like now. It's gorgeous inside and then this is the new construction. So this is the learning commons. Um, what you can see here, this is what the inside looks like. Very open, it's where the learning support center is, academic support, um, IT. Um, there's a coffee shop in there, it's, it's a nice area. It sits on the, across from the science center. Um, this is our new veterinary education center. So I know Logan was excited as a senior being able to finally get into this building. Um, um, it, it is beautiful inside, so it houses um, our animals, but also the veterinary technology program. Um, this is um, one of our labs right here and over here on the right. This is one of our, this is one of the surgical rooms, I believe, isn't it, Logan? Helps if I turn my mic on. That's okay. No, yeah. Pretty, yeah, yeah. And then this is the, the pre-op area right in here. So it is state-of-the-art. It's gorgeous. It looks like you're walking into a um, up, upscale veterinary clinic. Um, it, it's just amazing, the, the facility. And it sits right beside this building, which is the science complex. So we're, we're, we work synergistically with, with our two facilities. Our programs are tied very tightly with our faculty and our students. Um, and so the Brooks complex here um, houses biology, chemistry, biochemistry. Um, part of veterinary medical technology is still in here. Equestrian labs, psychology, mathematics, um, environmental science. Um, who am I missing? I think I got everyone. Um, so our labs and lecture halls. And then even if you're not a science student, you take classes here. It has the biggest auditorium um, and lecture rooms um, on campus. And this building is about 10 years old. So it's still state of the art. Um, but you can see the architecture ties in with the rest of the campus. And so I think just to give you a little preamble of, of Wilson and what I think we, we, we want to think we are as far as our mission. Um, we are student-centered and, and, and we want our students to be as open with us as possible. So I, I know when we meet with students um, the summer before the freshman year, they come for orientation and they meet with their, their advisors. You have this conversation of where you see yourself in five years. What do you wanna do? Um, we wanna be involved in your journey because what interests us um, may not interest you. And, and our job is to help help you get to where it is you want to be. So part of that obviously is, is undergrad, you wanna have a major. So you wanna graduate in four years, I mean, Zach did it in three, um, but you wanna do it in four usually, or maybe not, maybe five, depending on what you wanna do. Our job then is to create a plan for you um, academically and, and help you move along that plan. And then as things change, which your major may change or things occur, Maybe now you want to take a summer class or do something else. Um, we just begin to adjust our plan and, and we set our eyes on that goal. And so today's session is on some of you may want to go to vet school or med school or chiropractic school or physical therapy. We're looking at what you want to do beyond Wilson. So our job as academic advisors is to have that conversation early to set up the four-year plan so you satisfy the major, but you also satisfy what those programs require as well. And then set you up for success through the communication, being able to interview, um, writing, and things like that. So that's sort of 
what I think we believe in, that your success really is our success in many ways. And, and I hope that our students feel that among, with us as well. And so today we just wanna talk about some of these, some of these ideas, um, the pre-medical, the pre-chiropractic, the pre-veterinary and pre-physical therapy. And, and for the most part, there's very few institutions that will say that you're graduating with a pre-medical degree. Because um, really the question is, what do you do with a pre-medical degree? The goal really is to look at pre anything as a concentration, as a as a avenue upon through which you want to achieve something. And so the major you choose, which we'll see in a few moments, um, is one that will set you up even after four years if you don't get into the program you want to get into. Um, or you get in right away, but you still have a degree that you are satisfied with Wilson. So um, our job again is to have those conversations as early as possible. And so let's just look at this and I, I hope this will work. We, um, in the middle here is, will be your core science major and we'll see that in a minute. So you'll eventually declare a major your sophomore year, but for most of us in the sciences, um, a lot of our courses are sequ sequential. So you'll come in your freshman year, I want to be, I want to go to vet school. And so our question is going to be, well, what area do you want to be in? So if it's someone like Logan, um, VMT, so veterinary medical technology, but I want to go to vet school. Or it could be Zach, for example, or Gosser. Um, you know, I'm going to go to med school, but I'm going to focus on biology as my major. Um, as Zach mentioned already, we created a special major for him that pulled his interests of exercise science and biology together into a major to satisfy that. So we had that conversation up front with the, his goals or, or Logan's goals of this is what I ultimately want to do. So you'll see that we, we have a basic science courses um, that fulfill not only the major that we're in, or you're going to be in, um, but also the core requirements in many ways, the foundation of what these professional programs require. One thing I think that we're very happy about here with Wilson is we have smaller class sizes. We have the ability to have on hands-on laboratories. Um, there's very few laboratories that we have that are um, read a book and just do it, you know, follow the directions. Um, we really want our students to be investigative from gen bio all the way up to their senior year, regardless of the science major they're in, a lot of hands-on opportunities. Um, and that really allows you to gain that practical knowledge, which is going to set you up then for um, the programs that you want to get into post Wilson. Um, as you'll see, there's a lot of personal professional development that we want our students to achieve um, in the classroom and out of the classroom. And again, keep in mind we're a liberal arts college, so the core science major is basically in the middle of everything else that's liberal arts. And so a lot of our students will take courses in psychology, English, philosophy. Um, they may have minors. Um, I don't know, Logan, did you have a minor in anything? Uh, no, I didn't, but I was really close to getting a chem minor. <laughs> <laughs> We can still make that happen. Um, so yeah, so we can pursue minors. Zach, I can't remember if you had a minor or not. I can't remember anymore. It's been a year. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Um, but it is often common that our students in the sciences will, like VMT, for example, um, will have VMT bio concentration, may get a bio minor with that pretty easily. Um, the chem minor, we've had students do biology and chemistry dual majors. Um, or they pursue passions and, and I really like the art, so I'm gonna get a minor in, in one of the fine arts. Um, I'm seeing a lot more students that are pursuing minors in Spanish, especially in the sciences, um, going off to professional programs and, and, and having a minor in Spanish, especially in the oral um, component, being proficient in Spanish is, is really being helpful um, for us as a country. Um, so again, we, we, we look at the whole liberal arts background and how everything feeds together into that web that we create over the four years. Deb, did you want to say anything about the plan or anything? Well, no, I, I think there's a lot of variety that the students do complete in terms of um, pursuing interests in minors. We've had students um, who've majored in biology complete an English mm -hmm. minor. Um, someone uh, majored in VMT and completed a history minor. So it really, it really is, um, you know, as long as you're willing to think about it and talk to your advisor about it, um, it's a very, uh, it's very possible mm -hmm. um, to pursue an interest 
Um, I, I know that um, there's some um, interest, particularly for medical schools, that students um, have um, a minor in ethics, mm -hmm. or at least have um, some course background related to, um, to ethics. Yeah, and that's a good point that Dr. Deb just brought up. It's, you know, we look at the courses too that fulfill liberal arts requirements, but also give you a beginning of a foundation in a certain discipline. So depending on you want to go to vet school or med school or chiropractic or physical therapy, you know, courses in psychology, sociology, an ethics course, right? These are foundational courses, but it, it begins to develop this, this broader um, knowledge base for you to be successful then in the programs that you eventually want to pursue. So if we go back to those basic sciences, and regardless of which major you choose, which we're not there yet, um, you're going to have a lot of science. So whether you're VMT or your biology or your chemistry or exercise science, um, these, these majors are rooted in the, in the sciences. And so biologies, um, the, the organic and general chemistry, math um, becomes very important. Um, and then we have those conversations. What level of math do you need to, to get to for the program that you're looking at? Um, do you need a statistics course versus organic, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, organic calculus too? So what level of math is best for you? And that's where we have these conversations. If I really want to go to vet school, the question I'll have with my advisees is which vet schools are you really interested in? Um, because like it or not, the vet schools um, can have differences in their requirements. And so some vet schools like, oh, I want Calc 1 and I want a stats course. Um, a vet school could say, no, I really want two levels of calculus. If you're going to med school, then there's differences there too as to what they may want. But the nice thing with medical schools is there is a commonality um, with the medical schools over the vet schools. And then chiropractic schools can be different or different too. So it's just that knowledge base of where your aspirations are. Then we, we put the core courses in with the basics and then see, do I need two semesters of physics or do I need just one semester of physics? And again, that's gonna depend on which program ultimately you're looking to go to. So like I said, once we get to our sophomore year, you officially declare your major, although in the sciences, we're working through a goal, even our freshman year. Um, and regardless of the major, um, whether you're veterinary medical technology or your biology major, um, or even exercise science, um, you're starting off a lot of the core classes together as a freshman. So you're taking the gen bio, um, you're starting depending, you may come in and start taking chemistry too, or that may put off to your sophomore year, but you're starting in this, in this core your freshman year. And then once you are looking at, I'm really going VMT, veterinary medical top technology, then you're gonna take some different classes. I mean, most of the students still take genetics um, their sophomore year. Again, we start seeing changes then with the advising profiles once a student is getting into their, their pathways that they're looking at. So, these are, again, these are the majors that a student then is pursuing traditionally for these professional programs. And so, for example, if I want to go to medical school, traditionally, biology, biochemistry, chemistry um, are the traditional historic majors, although with med school, you can be any major as long as you fulfill the requirements um, for medical school. Um, veterinary school, um, for Wilson, um, the veterinary medical technology, bioconcentration track as a major, the biology, um, biochem, chemistry is also doable. So again, it's a matter of which major you choose and then making sure you get the courses fulfilled for the major requirements, as well as the courses for um, the, the program. So in Logan's case with veterinary medical technology, it's ABMA certified. So there's courses that must be completed for the VMT program. And then in Logan's case, she also wanted to go to vet school so what are the courses that the VMT program doesn't require as a major, but that I still want to get done? Um, so again, it's an advising profile. So we're, we do the four-year plan. You put all the courses in for the major with the rotations. It's like, okay, here's a window for this one, this one, this one, and just working it through to get those requirements done. Oh, and also want to say, 
students can change their major. Um, so again, it's, it's making sure you change your major. Um, when you do that, talk to your advisor and you may have to change your four-year plan. Um, and Zach is a good example. I mean, I think Zach, you came in uh, biology with nutrition as a focus, right? And then, then I think we finally then moved into another program and then he threw it on me. I want to get done in three years. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> So um, that worked out really well, but it was open conversations the entire way. In fact, I think um, we had conversations and meetings with myself, Zach, and another academic advisor, um, Dr. Hess Kling. Three of us were working together, which made it even much more streamlined. So we didn't miss anything and, and was able then to look at Zach's aspirations and, and put the plan together in a, in a way that was going to work and meet his aspirations and goals, um, but also the goals of the academic institution so it wasn't it wasn't short or anything for the major requirements as well I, w I wanted the students to talk a little bit here but one thing i think that we can afford as a smaller college is that we try to get out of the traditional classroom setting that we try to offer experiences um, not just in the sciences but we see a lot in the sciences with the hands-on experiential type interactions and let's put either of them on the spot, but could both of you maybe say what might have been, you know, some of your most meaningful um, sort of non-traditional experiences within your programs um, that help set you up, you think, um, for what your plans are? Logan, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. <laughs> So I would like to say that this is the reason that uh, I ended up choosing Wilson is just because of how hands-on it is, especially with the VMT program. So gosh, narrowing it down to maybe one or two. I'll give you two. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Two? Okay. <laughs> so, um, probably I'll have to say this past semester uh, was the big building point. I finally was in surgery. So I was using all the techniques that I had learned hands-on in other labs and I actually got to suture and like closing up a dog that Dr. Bates had just done surgery on. And I mean, that just was just amazing for me that I, you know, hadn't even graduated from college and I was already doing some type of small surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and probably another thing with the VMT program is just, it isn't just da dogs and cats. Um, I know, I think it was my, uh, second year here, I worked in the barn and we were rumping sheep, which is sitting them on their butt and treating them for foot rot. And you just can't get that at any other school, really. So uh, really memorable for me. And those are skills that I'm going to take with me to vet school. And I'm already going to have a head start. So I think it'll just make it all the better for me. Zach? Um, you know, with regards to exercise science, uh, we went to a retirement home uh, two or three times during my time there, and we actually um, did some exercise testing with some, and I think that was really beneficial for me specifically just because of the program I'm in now. I'm going to have to be a lot like hands-on, you know, one-on-one conversations with people, so being able to do those exercises with um, the people at the retirement homes, um, describing to them what we're going to be doing, their results and everything, I just think that was really beneficial for me. All right, thank you. I, I think I can, I'll give one too. So like this past semester, there's another student that's graduated. Um, Logan knows her very well. So I was, I was asked to be the, um, the client, the owner of a dog coming into the client as a client, right? And the students were, had to deal with, um, <laughs> with me or any was other people doing it too, but we were actually in the new facility and um, this, the class was in the classroom in the science center, but we were being zoomed live streamed into the classroom while the case was developing between me as a client and Rhea, Rhea McKee, the other student just graduated, um, was the, was the, the te technician that had to deal with me and explain to me uh, what was wrong with my dog and my follow-up care, right? So Rhea didn't know what I was told ahead of time. So of course I could ask all kinds of questions um, but then the class got to observe all of that during real time. And then we came back out and joined the class as a follow-up. So it, it's just an example of, you know, we can simulate these real life experiences um, and then be able to really discuss them. And, and that's just 
a neat example that happened. I guess it was like, I guess it was in the fall, wasn't it? This whole time just, yeah, it was, in the it, fall. Was, it was fall semester, right? So, but again, it, it's neat that we're able to do that and give our students a real life experience before they get out there and practice. And, you know, the first time they're dealing with a, um, a client that has questions, <laughs> um, good or bad, right? You can actually get that feedback and what, what went well, because part of our mission is also that communication is, is the oral communication, written communication, and being able to deal with individuals um, in all the different settings, because all these professions that are professional can be dealing with a lot of people um, and being able to communicate. So thank you both for that. Um, and I, I'm gonna put you guys back on the spot again. So as I mentioned before, um, we, we really want our students to excel and give them and afford them the opportunities um, to, while they're still an undergraduate student, to, to experience um, and grow um, in a safe environment. So in our area, for example, in the biology, biochemistry, and chemistry, our students do a three-semester research experience, and that research is, is self-driven. Um, Logan already said that one of their highlights and the capstone of them is, is applying everything they've learned into surgery and learning you know, the surgery process and going through that, that course. And so the sciences, we have these capstones and these experiential programs. Um, we, we have our students go to conferences um, and present. Um, we have student clubs and organizations where they, they go off to, I think there's a picture there, I think of the, one of the teaching centers, the vet centers. I don't know if that's Logan, was, your, was that your group? Or? Yeah, that was pre-vet yeah, club. Yeah. Visiting, uh, and there's a, yeah, and there's a picture there also of the XY Science Club. Um, um, and so different things like that. So I don't know if Logan and Zach can, can you mention a couple of things about maybe some of the opportunities that you had as undergraduates um, outside of the classroom, right, that um, afforded you the ability to grow and how that feeds into your aspirations and where you are right now. I'll start again. So uh, I really want to point out that uh, Wilson's big on trying to help you develop personal skills. And for me, leadership is a really big thing. So I immediately joined pre-vet club. I had no intentions of becoming president, but eventually I did. Um, and it was a great experience. Um, being able to help uh, plan events and then attend those events with other aspiring uh, pre-vet students was uh, life-changing for me. I really will say it that way. Uh, we were able to go to veterinary conferences. We were able to go visit other schools. And in addition to developing relationships with other students, I was able to develop relationships with people that I was communicating with to uh, establish these plans. And I really just feel that uh, that's something I'll, I'll definitely take with me is the leadership skills that I developed with pre-vet club. If I can interject there too, I mean, I know you all had a um, a veterinary school student panel, I believe, um, pre-COVID, um, where I think it was, was it you and Kelly and Sam? So students that were all accepted to vet school had a panel discussion um, with students that were interested in going to vet school. So that was a student-driven, student engagement interaction where students were given the pointers, right? And I don't know, I mean, faculty weren't really interjecting during that process. So it was a student-student engagement. So again, another neat opportunity. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to point out there's really actually no faculty involved. So it was a really like, I know some students can be a little hesitant to ask questions in the presence of faculty. So it was actually just students with other students. So that it was a really comfortable environment. Yeah. Zach, do you want to, um, just you know, talk a little bit about your, your research and, and how that all came together for you. Yeah, so uh, I'm really grateful I was able to do the research uh, project. Uh, myself, Dr. Harriger, Dr. Tanya Hess-Kling, and then her husband, Dr. Derek Kling, um, we all did research on the effects of physical therapy before a total knee replacement surgery, and then we would see how that would affect the outcomes um, with regards to range of motion. And for me, I'm definitely more of an introverted person. You know, I don't like to really talk that much, but um, through this process, I definitely opened up and got a lot better at public speaking. And again, for the field I'm going in, I got to communicate with my patients and stuff like that. So I think that really helped me. Great. 
And, and so again, Zach made a, a good point there on the communication that from the freshman year, um, we, we try to expose the students to, you know, being outside the box a little bit, outside of their comfort zone. So in Gen Bio, for example, all the students do a research paper, but also have to do an oral presentation. And so we have oral presentations that are built into the sequences of courses and a lot of the sciences. Um, to kind of like Zach said, you know, get you out of your comfort zone a little bit, but to, to teach you um, that ability to be able to speak. Um, you can be very nervous, um, but you don't always want to show it. Um, so how do, you, how do you handle that inside internally um, and, and still come across um, in a way? So there's a picture there of Zach and that was at the Pennsylvania Academy of Science meeting. Um, it's a state meeting. Um, it's, it's one that's, as faculty, we think it's pretty low pressure. Um, I know the students don't always agree with us, um, but it's you know, an opportunity for the students to present their research um, in a, in a student-friendly um, environment from, with students from other institutions across the state. So it makes it really nice. And these are opportunities. We go for the whole weekend. And, and again, the, the, the college, like Logan even said, being able to go to other AVMA meetings, things like that. I mean, the, the college tries to support as much of that um, so it doesn't put the, the bill back on the students. So we try to incorporate that as much as we can into the learning experience um, for the students. Um, anything else? I know, um, Zach, you worked with uh, two different centers um, for your research. Logan, did you work with any other veterinary clinics or anything? You're in, you did an internship. Yeah, so I did do an internship uh, as well as outside volunteering hours. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, with the VMT program, there is an internship built into it. And that definitely helped me develop more skills than just the hands-on things. Um, it allowed you to, me to use the skills that Wilson's VMT program taught me. Uh, I actually internship in about 35 minutes from campus. So I was able to still do my classes and stuff. But um, yeah, it was, it was a really good experience. And they build that in definitely so we can continue to build the skills maybe we don't want to push ourselves to do, especially <laughs> work with communication. <laughs> so again, so there's different examples then of, of internships. You mentioned the volunteering. Um, you know, we have nursing homes real close to us, which I know Zach already mentioned. So we, we try to get our students out into real world settings in a supervised state. Um, but again, to be able to put um, what you learn into practice um, before you get out there and go to the real world even more so. So I wanted Deb to talk about this. This is one of the things that we get to then is, again, the personal approach and and the success of our students. So we, we take all this forward to freshman year, sophomore year. In your junior year, you start really becoming serious on thinking about, I gotta write letters of, have letters of recommendation, have I done my service hours? What program am I applying to? Is there a service for me that's gonna help me? So um, the VMCIS for vet schools, the AMCAS for medical schools, there's chiropractic college guidelines, um, so Deb, do you want to talk a little about some of the things that we're able to do then from an academic and advisor perspective to help the students? Then we'll go back to the students and, and see, you know, what they felt the value might have been and what they participated in. Yeah, I, I think um, this personal approach um, starts with uh, advising. And it's um, something that as faculty members, I know myself, um, I love doing academic advising. I love um, working with students and, and asking, you know, what are your goals and how can we best get the, um, get the courses that you are required to take um, into a, a plan, but how can you also expand the um, educational experience that you're going to have at Wilson to make it uh, the best that it can uh, for your future plans. And, you know, it's interesting to me that students uh, sometimes really do hesitate if they change their mind uh, in what they, what they want to do. You know, well, I don't want to disappoint you, you know, is often what I hear, but that's, you know, it, it's not about me. It's about um, what I can do to help you to reach the goals that you have. And if those goals change, that's absolutely, you know, that's absolutely fine. 
Um, as an academic advisor, uh, we're very often asked to write um, letters of recommendation, and those letters can be um, individual letters. Um, it seems that med schools in particular prefer to have um, committee letters, and that's something that then we have a group of faculty who get together um, and uh, write uh, a committee letter. But I think the strength of this personal approach and how it contributes to the content of the letter of recommendation, um, we can give very specific examples um, about our students, uh, what their, particularly what their strengths um, happen to be. Uh, you know, we can describe a student who's gone through a research uh, sequence and how they've developed as an individual. Um, not only in their skills in terms of doing the research, but their skills in um, giving oral presentations um, and in writing the thesis. And I think those very specific, rather than vague statements of, oh yeah, this student is great, we can say this student is great because, and we can give um, a lot of um, reasons um, for that and why, you know, how we view that particular student contributing to the field that they're moving um, toward. Uh, so that, you know, getting to know the people who are going to write the letters of recommendation, I think, are really um, important. And that applies to, um, as you get these experiences outside of um, Wilson as well, you know, in the internships, in the volunteer hours, that students have talked about, you know, building um, a mentor-mentee relationship, um, not only within Wilson, but outside of Wilson, um, can connect you then as you um, need letters of recommendation from different types of people, because it's not just faculty who you'll be uh, required to ask for um, a letter of recommendation. So if you can build those um, types of relationships, you know, certainly the faculty in biology and chemistry um, and sometimes um, even exercise science when we can pull, um, you know, students into research that way, um, establish very strong um, mentor-mentee uh, relationships. Um, we want the research projects to be as independent as possible, but not so independent that we don't have an awareness of what is going on or you know we're, we want to be available to problem solve um, but we want our students in the same sense to come in and say hey i've run into this problem what do you think about trying this this or this um, rather than saying you know I, I ran into a problem now what do i do you know the the, the fact that students are willing to at least think about how they can work around um, a particular issue um, in their research project. Um, I, you know, I find those types of interactions um, very, very rewarding. And one of the things we do with that research project is that it's the students who decide the topics. Um, you know, I said before, I'm a chemist. Well, I've worked with students who have um, done microbiology projects or projects with muscles. Uh, and I mean um, the invertebrate muscle, not <laughs> not flexing their muscles, you know, or uh, something like that. But you know, but I also work with chemistry students. But it's amazing what I've learned in the process of being that mentor um, to the students. And you know, they they tell us, you know, once they get out. And I know this is something that we're going to ask the students to talk about, but. Uh, they tell us when they get into their um, pre-professional or their professional schools and then even beyond that, um, the value of those um, research uh, interactions uh, that they have had with um, the faculty. Um, we do tell students that if they want to do mock interviews when they're getting ready to um, go on interviews that, you know, we can set up mock interviews. Um, I know Zach took advantage of that. I'm M Logan, I don't think we had the opportunity to get one set up for you. Um, but you know Zach can maybe address how he felt that um, helped 
in the interview um, process. Um, yeah, that helped a lot. I was really nervous, like really nervous before I went up for my interview and stuff, but I sat down with Dr. Herger and Dr. Dr. S. Kling, and we went through a whole bunch of mock interview questions and just ways to improve um, the way I would answer the questions. And by the time I went up there, it was, you know, smooth sailing. And also when I was with my interview, um, I talked about my research for like 15 minutes with the interviewee, so it, or interviewer. So it was, it was very laid back and um, it was just easy to talk to them just because I had the research experience. And that's something that um, from an advising standpoint, we will definitely um, keep an eye on uh, depending upon what school, whether it's med school, vet school, chiropractic school, um, do they look favorably um, at you having a research um, experience? And, you know, in some ways it depends upon what, what the school um, is. But, you know, we tell our students that the best way to um, stand out in applying for a pre-professional school is to make sure that you have something that you're presenting that is very unique um, so that, you know, when, when they are looking at you based on the application, so looking at the paper, it's like, wow, this student um, has really done something during their undergraduate um, experience, whether it be research or other types of activities that they have um, participated in. Um, so just again, going to the students, um, what do you think um, made you look unique when you applied um, to vet school or chiropractic school? Um. That's kind of a tough question. I don't actually know. I will say that I um, balanced a lot of different things as far as like I was taking pretty rigorous classes. So at one point I know I was taking anatomy and physiology, uh, gen chem two, uh, clinical practices. Uh, I was doing that, uh, keeping good grades, but I was also working like 20 hours a week and also holding leadership roles. Um, so I definitely think that's one thing that helped me stand out. It wasn't that, you know, I could just keep good grades, but I could keep good grades and also, you know, uh, be a well-rounded individual. Uh, and Wilson definitely allows for many opportunities for that. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely one thing I think helped me. Yeah, um, again, the research definitely helped. Um, my advisors had connections uh, to places where I could go observe and shadow. So I had roughly 180 hours of observation before I went in for an interview. So that was definitely something that I think made me stand out um, above other um, applicants, applicants. So I think too, I'll, I'll sort of reinforce what Logan said and what Deb said too in the letters is um, with Logan and Zach, um, it's not just the coursework. Um, you know, both were working. Um, Zach, you also were on the volleyball team. Um, and so again, when in these personal letters, when we really get to know the students, then you can bring those, those things out in the letter. It's beyond, okay, this is a student that's a 3.9 GPA. I mean, it's look what else they were able to do while they balanced all that. So that perseverance, that time management, um, being able to deal with what is coming your way um, in many ways, holding part-time jobs, full-time jobs, um, on top of your job of being a student um, and other things like that. So like just to echo what Deb was saying, it, that all comes out in these letters that we get to know the students so well. Um, I've even had students say, don't cut yourself, uh, tell students don't cut yourself short. You know, we, we have the ability to read their essays before they submit them and, and we can't write them. It's like, you never mentioned this. I mean, what about that? Right, so I think even the students sometimes get so focused on these essays that they're they're more like tunnel vision, and it's like, but wait a minute, you need to talk about that other experience that you had because that's going to bring a whole other side out in that um, essay, for example. So what Deb was saying, you know, what sets you apart on paper are these individual experiences in this journey that we're on together. Um, we don't like talk about ourselves many times. So it's like your advisor or other people want, yeah, but don't cut yourself short on, on that other thing you did. 
you may not think it was a big deal, but in, in the bigger picture, um, it says a lot about you as an individual and the perseverance. And Logan, what was that other thing that you did? Oh yeah, Logan. Over the summer. Oh, my, my research or? Yeah. 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 So that wasn't necessarily through Wilson. So unfortunately, That's okay. um, yeah. So I ended up transferring to Wilson and still wanted to finish my degree in four years. So I only had three years here, so I couldn't do research at Wilson. So I found a little, uh, loop through the Shingatik Bay field station yep. Yep. down at Wallops, Wallops Island. And I actually spent three weeks doing research on, uh, marine mammals, specifically the bottlenose dolphins. And so I did a, even though it was only three weeks, I did a whole little project on photo identification of uh, dolphin fins and their unique individuality. So yeah, that probably set me apart a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Definitely a great experience. Highly recommend. <laughs> so we even had to encourage her to talk about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> so we just kind of talk about what the students think, but um, you know, do you guys have anything else you want to want to add or contribute um, at this point. I mean, we, we, we're hoping that you get the idea out there that um, we are student-centered. Um, I think some of us still think we're students in many ways. We learn with our students um, regarding, you know, whether it be the research experience or just having conversations in the hallway or the office and, you know, things like this too. What helps? So what your struggles were what your what the pluses what the negatives were we learned from that as well so we don't we ourselves don't make the same mistakes um going back and reflecting on how we deliver material what works better what could work better um in the end for the classes coming up behind you right is always our goal as well so um like i said your successes are ours but we're already thinking about the successes of the students still coming up um, so we try to do that as, um, as much as possible. So do either of you have anything else you, you want to add? I mean, Zach, you have almost, almost a, well, not quite a year done, but it'll be, it'll be soon as, how do you, how do you think that you, um, if you compare yourself with the other first year students in your chiropractic program, and know Carson's there too, so we actually have two, two Wilson students there. How, how do you think, your Wilson education um, has set you up for your program in comparison to students from other other programs. Yeah, um, actually, Carson and I have talked about this before. Um, so anatomy, uh, specifically with lab, just because uh, now we do it with, with cadavers, but in gen bio and anatomy, we would I think we did cats and forget what else we dissected, but it was just nice to um, have that exposure. Um, also for my histology class, we were exposed to some of that in biology as well. So it was just more beneficial um, going into the program to have that compared to people who maybe went to bigger state schools. Um, and then also just having the uh, smaller student, the facu faculty ratio, I think really helps. Just everyone knows everyone by name and I think that makes it more personable and uh, an enjoyable process. Zach, just correct me if I'm, I can't remember anymore, but um, were, did you guys use the BodyViz software when you took AMP? Was that the first year we had BodyViz? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Wilson, we have, um, we use a program called BodyViz. It's used a lot of med schools, um, but it, we're one of the first, first small schools to use it. So it's actually um, like a three-dimensional human anatomy that we use to supplement the other dissections. Um, so again, it gives you that virtual, real interaction as an undergrad to get you ready then for what you want to do then later on. Um, Logan, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I guess I just wanted to add to reiterate the fact that you're talking about making these connections, especially with your advisor. Uh, I was lucky enough to have Deb as my advisor. And I will say early on, um, I felt like we really gained a connection and being able to talk to her and come to her about any little question I had just from early on really helped set me up to be prepared to do what I needed to do for my application process. Uh, you know, she made me feel welcome. I, I never was hesitant to ask a question, even if I felt it was stupid. <laughs> uh, and yes, I never were. <laughs> Very welcoming, very nice. I know some of them were stupid, but, um, but uh, I mean, 
that's one thing I think Wilson just stands above the rest. You, you make those connections. And I, I feel like it was very beneficial for me. And, and I think too, I mean, it's, it's, people can think we're, you know, we're, this, this is us. I mean, I, this is how we are. Um, so students can pop in. I mean, I got to know Logan probably more because her, one of her best friends was one of my advisees and the two of them are in my office. Uh, so you get to know students in different, in different venues, but the faculty also, one thing I think the students see is we interact very closely. So the biology faculty are already interacting with the chemistry faculty and the exercise science faculty and the VMT faculty. I mean, if we're doing projects, I mean, it's very common that I'm already aware of something going on and the students like, how did you already find that out? Well, guess what? You know, I mean, I got an email or a phone call from another faculty member about such and such and, you know, here it is. So we're small enough that our departments are already working synergistically in the sciences of the collective, which it's a strength for the students because the students, I'm hoping, also see how real life science really works that you're not an island, that all these different departments are reliant on each other um, to eventually come to the final solution. So if I'm doing a research project and I'm, I have guinea pigs on a project and the one seems not to be feeling well, I, go to, I know who I'm going to go to to look at it. And sometimes it may be a VMT, upper class VMT student um, who may come in and help something too. So there's all these opportunities to sort of develop and just present themselves. Um, but as a faculty, we're not like, oh, well, that's the chemistry department. We shouldn't go talk to them or that's that department. And, you know, don't go out of your department, um, which are bigger institutions. That is sometimes the way it is. We're already working um, as a collective. Um, and we, I think we model a lot um, what is real life. So I, I hope that's true. And I did want to mention, too, that we do have some articulations and programs. Um, as Zach already said, he is at the New York Chiropractic College. We have an articulation agreement with them. We also have an articulation agreement with Jefferson um, down in Philadelphia. Um, we have a really neat partnership. We're one of only a couple of small colleges that have a direct partnership with the, um, the George Mason, Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. That is the research arm of the National Zoo of the Smithsonian. It's in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, and so our students can spend a whole semester at that facility um, and do work with endangered species. Um, and so I know sometimes it's hard to be away for a whole semester. So that's part of that four year plan. What semester would you like to go? Um, and so you can be an animal science major, a VMT major, biology major. Um, but the, the neat thing too is this is developing as we keep moving forward and, and realizing that not every student can be away for a whole semester. Um, we now have opportunities just in the summer. So, you know, Logan, you can close your ears. But, you know, theoretically, um, Logan could have spent um, four weeks intensive at the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation just doing a research project and working with international um, veterinarians and researchers with the Smithsonian. Um, and so now we've had several students. We had two here this spring. We have three, three going in the fall um, from different areas. And again, being able to work side by side with um you know smithsonian based researchers which is which is phenomenal um and we also do research with the usda so again there's different opportunities there so being a small institution we have a lot to offer um outside of the classroom with our collaborations and our partnerships i i have to mention also um, that we do have an nsf um grant um, this is called Encompass. It STEM for Lifelong Success at Wilson. And so some of you in the audience um, may qualify for this opportunity. It is a competitive scholarship. It's a five-year grant program. But um, we can give you four years of funding, up to $9,700. That is not repayable. It's, it's on top of everything else you would get. There are some stipulations. Um, you have to be a biology, biochemistry, or chemistry major, which will be appertain to what we're talking about today. It also fulfills the environmental science major as well. Um, and there are some other stipulations on what high school you may have gone to, things like that. Um, so for example, Zach, you, you, you would have qualified for this if you were a freshman. Um, so if you want to start all over again, um, let me know. Um, just kidding. But I don't think you want to start over again as a freshman, do you, Zach? But, but here we have uh, an NSF grant. And the neat thing about this grant 
um, there was nothing that we had to change academically. So I'm, I'm, as a faculty member, I'm very proud to say that the NSF looked at our academic programs and in the sciences and said, don't change what you're doing. Um, and this program is really looking at the support network for the students in these majors, um, building a, a network of support. Um, I can talk for Logan and Zach, it's not easy. In the sciences, it's, it's a little more stressful. It's not that it's hard, but it's rigorous. You choose a profession you love, that you have a passion for, but there's a lot of stress and anxiety and the pace and everything else that goes with it. And so this Encompass program is developing um, lifelong support systems, um, whether it be through mentor, mentorship, um, alumni intervention, but also how do you reduce your anxiety? How do you um, find balance in your life in many ways? And then those skill sets and you hopefully move forward to as you pursue your career. So those in the audience, um, if you're interested, please reach out to Michael or the admissions counselors or you'll find you can contact me as well and see if you do qualify for that. And speaking of which, I'm open up for questions, Michael, if there are any, but there's our emails. Um, so you can email Deb directly, myself, and unfortunately, Dr. Heskling, you've heard her name several times, um, could not be with us here today. She was going to try to try to, try to to click in with us, and uh, Gosser obviously didn't have clinics either. So I do appreciate Logan and Zach so much for uh, joining us today, and, um, and Deb as well. Um, Michael, are there any questions? Yes. Um, and before I get into questions, uh, first, yes, thank you all. That was amazing. Um, and I want to say that we actually do have a lot of questions, uh, but only three that we have to answer because over the course of this, you actually hit a lot of them. So I always love getting really good at that. Isn't that the guy from Johnny Carson and everything? They could yeah. barely knew the answer. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see what we got here. Um, okay. This one, um, and we've been getting this kind of question a lot. Um, this was specifically about VMT, but I think it's worth opening up just in the sciences in general. Um, you know, and I know, Zach, I believe uh, there was mentioned that you would play volleyball. I apologize, Logan. I'm not sure if you had played anything. Um, you know, how does that work with athletics? You know, if you have to go to a game and you miss a lab, um, you know, obviously keeping on track for, you know, the application process after Wilson is important. So how, how does balancing out um, those two things kind of work? Zach, do you want to focus up on answering that? Yeah. Uh, so you turn in a sheet at the beginning of the semester with all of uh, your games and if they're going to interfere with the class or not. And professors are very reasonable with that. Um, that's really all you have to do. With regards to balancing the workload for um, athletics and your coursework, I mean, it's, it's cliche, it's all about time management. Um, if you, I mean, if you want to get it done, you'll get it done. If it's important to you, you'll get it done. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just time management is the biggest thing. Also to add on to that as an advisor, we do receive um, all the sports schedules prior to registration time. So. For example, for Zach, if, if volleyball, we know the season and, and volleyball does have some fall, but the main season goes into the spring semester. So if we have courses with multiple lab sections and we know when the away games are or what the schedules are, we can then advise, you know, you want to be in the Thursday morning lab section because the Thursday afternoon you're going to miss four labs due to away games, for example. And sometimes you, if, there's, if it's an upper level class and you only have one lab section, then that's a different conversation. Like Zach said, is, as long as we're upfront about it, it's being proactive than being reactive. So you don't come in and say, oh, I missed lab yesterday. What should I do? It's I have an away game that was rescheduled, whatever, and I'm going to miss lab this week. What should I do? Right. So it's that conversation up front. Um, but as advisors, we also try to work with the athletic department very closely so our students, our student athletes, are not put as much into that jam um, because it's hard sometimes to make it up, especially if there's only one section in an upper level class versus a lower level where there's multiple sections. And I'd like to add, too, um, just this past year, um, 
I can think of at least one, but there was um, a student majoring in BMT planning to go to vet school uh, on the soccer team. Uh, she was recognized as a scholar athlete um, and her GPA was is close to, well, I think it's just a little bit over 3.9. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's possible, like Zach said, if you want it and, and, you know, you do um, what you can to make it happen. And I like when I work with students um, in advising to try to keep the, um, see the semester when they're um, doing competitive um, uh, games, keep that a little bit lighter if it's possible. So again, there's that balance um, that we can work on um, knowing ahead, okay, soccer's in the fall, so we'll, let's look at the fall season, uh, or yeah, let's look at the fall semester when you're in season and then look at the spring, we can maybe load it up a little bit more. So that, that helps um, as well. All right, fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, and I will say, I, I know time management does come up a lot and that's the one thing at least you know, from my own experience, I will say that I, our students, especially the athletes, um, you know, are exceptional at. I actually, you know, over the course of my time here, I've had a number of, um, you know, former student athletes actually on staff and admissions. And that's the one thing they don't need to be trained how to do time management. They know how to balance, you know, what they need to get done and, and they do it. And that's the one thing I will say, you know, for an undergrad, that's a huge, you know, skill to have um, and move on into the workforce. So definitely, you know, it's a lot to take on, but um, yeah, there's a lot of help and it's definitely going to help you afterward too. And let me take a look here. Um, okay, this one is, um, you know, about getting into vet school or of course anywhere else. Um, is going after a double major um, recommended? Is that something that's looked highly on? And if so, how difficult is it to do that if you're looking at say VMT in biology? Um, doing a double major, I don't believe is, um, necessarily put you at, um, an advantage. Um, we've had some students who do pursue, um, a double major, but in most cases, not all, but in most cases, um, you're looking at a fifth year. And essentially, um, the ones that I'm thinking of, um, may have, completed, let's say the VMT degree, uh, applied to vet school, didn't get in the first application, and then came back and finished up uh, the, um, uh, the second major. So it, it can be part of a, of a fallback plan, but I think the main thing that you need to um, consider, I mean, Logan had one major, Zach had a special major, but it, and it combined two areas, uh, you really need to look at how you perform, um, especially in the sciences. That's where a lot of weight um, is going to be placed, um, particularly in vet school. We do know that. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of weight is put on the last, um, well, let's see, the application would be sent in in the fall of the senior year, so the three semesters prior to that, so spring of sophomore and uh, the whole junior year, there's a lot of emphasis put on um, how you perform in those three semesters in addition to how you perform academically. So, um, you know, depending upon what the major happens to be, um, you may not be able to finish a double major in four years. Um, you know, part of it depends upon placement in math. Um, that's, that's often um, a big stumbling block um, in terms of trying to do more. Um, you may have to do summer, uh, some summer courses um, to get even the VMT major and the pre-vet uh, requirements completed. Um, but the the one thing there that we have to keep in mind as advisors is that vet schools don't want you to take any of your sciences over the summer. Um, they want you to be, they want to see how you can perform with, you know, a, a hefty load um, in a given semester 
when you have a number of science um, courses, because that's essentially what you're going to be doing when you get to vet school. Um, so I would say that the double major, I don't, I don't feel, um, offers um, a huge advantage. Um, we do very carefully plan with students what their backup will be if they don't get into vet school, um, the first application, because we know nationally um, the percentage runs about between 15 and 33 percent of first-time applicants um, do get in. Um, we've been very fortunate this year. I'm aware, and Logan, you might know others, but I'm aware of four students who applied this year. And, and all, all four got in. Yeah, and all four got in. Yeah, and all four got in. So we have um, Western University, Purdue, uh, the Virginia, Maryland, and then Ross University in the Caribbean um, are where the students are planning to, uh, to go. But there are backup plans, um, just in case um, someone doesn't get in. Yes, like I said in the beginning, we want to focus on what is your major, so you have a major to, to support you. And I also add that we also have students that may have taken dual enrollment or other things as a high school student. So to get back to the double major, you know, we've had students that come in and, for example, they may have already taken an equivalent of general biology. So they've gained a year of, so they can actually start in the genetics, for example. So, I mean, those are all case by case situations as well as to what you might have done, what would transfer in if it's equivalent. Um, in Logan's case, right, she transferred. So again, did everything transfer in? If not, where is a shortcoming? In Zach's case, he wanted to be done in three years. He was taking classes, I think, 12 months out of the year for three years. Um, summer courses, courses over J term, but it was a it was a different mission, right? To to get done in three, but again, the, his core courses were done in the during the academic year, and it was other courses to supplement um, were were taken in the in the summer, for example. So um, again, it gets back to your advising and having an open conversation and really looking at what is you want to do, what like Deb said, what is your fallback, um, and I will say as Wilson. Um, I, I think our students do very well. Um, when academically, it's, that's part of it. But, you know, I always tell my students, we can't be there for the interview. You know, we can help you get to that interview. We can help you with the skill sets for the interview. But our students do very well in the interviews because of what they've been placed in, in the VMT major, the bio major, the chemistry, the exercise science, these, these different opportunities they've had that they land on their feet very well. And then they rise above other applicants in that process. So I really feel that the reason we got all four students in at different schools has to do with how they sold themselves, right, in that interview process. Um, and that goes back on those, those skill sets that they developed through all these opportunities over the four, well, actually over three years in many ways. Yeah, that's great. And, and funnily enough, um, we got another question in while we were talking about that, which actually was asking about our acceptance rate into vet school. So you guys just, you keep answering them before you even know they exist. Um, well, and you know, that, that does vary, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we might have, you know, two students apply and, and one gets in, or three students, or four students apply and three get in. But we seem to do, um, you know, Wilson seems to have a very good track record. Um, and I think that speaks to the, the students um, themselves um, as, you know, because it's what they then take from Wilson and how they grow um, that lets, you know, that makes them able to best um, represent themselves when they do get on these interviews. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think we, you know, I can safely say that we typically run above the, the national average um, of people um, being accepted to um, vet school. But it does, the, you know, the percentage definitely varies year, year to year. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, second time applicants, um, you know, we have students who have, have um, taken off for 
um, and maybe worked in practice for two, three, four years and all of a sudden say, yeah, I really do want to go to vet school. And, um, you know, they apply and they get in then. Um, now, they, they tried before, you know, they tried once, this is their second time. But, um, you know, that perseverance, and I know Dana had, had said earlier about, um, you know, motivation and perseverance and determination. That's huge when it comes to the reapplication um, if you have to go that way um, for uh, vet school. And the same applies for medical schools. That's a fortunate Gosser couldn't join us, but he was a double major. He actually did a summer program application through Summit Health, which is now Wellspan, um, shadowing, working with different physicians. That was an application process, um, you know, and, and landed a, a great opportunity in med school. Um, we've had students who want to go to med school and maybe didn't get in the first time and they pursue a master's and then go back. So there's these, there's these different pathways that we have these conversations with the students. I think as long as the students are open to the reality that, you know, sometimes it isn't always the first time, but what do you, what do you want to do? And sometimes I hate to say this, but it's almost like you have to um, demonstrate, right, your passion um, and then you do that and then it's like, oh, okay, right? So it's like going for a master, which I know is two more years perhaps, but, you know, sometimes we're, we're getting a job as a technician in the sciences, right, to demonstrate or maybe taking a class that just to demonstrate that, yeah, I, I did have a little snippet right there, but I, I want to demonstrate to you that I really, it was just a little blip on the, on the radar screen. So these are all conversations we have with the students. Um, as they're moving through and again because students are open with us then we get to that rapport we build you know rejection is part of life sometimes but how do we handle that rejection and take it as a learning opportunity to move forward and say okay what are we going to do about that what do you still want to do all right thank you and it looks like uh, unless something else comes in we just have one final question um and this is about the articulation agreements um that you talked about at the end Mm -hmm. um, mainly based around the New York chiropractic and Thomas Jefferson. Um, the question is basically, are, you know, those articulation agreements, are they a guarantee? And if so, is that competitive as in, are there X number of students that we have the ability to, you know, offer that to every year? Or is that if you meet the criteria, you know, you're good to go? Yeah, I, I mean, Zach is currently at New York and so is Carson. Um, there are no guarantees. Um, so where the articulations work, we even our partnership with the Smithsonian, they hold so many positions for us every semester. It doesn't mean the students just get in automatically. So you still have to fulfill the criteria of the program. Um, you still have to go through the application process. I mean, like Zach said, he still had to apply. He had to be accepted. He had to go through an interview. Um, but having the articulations and these partnerships um, really helps to solidify, you know, between undergraduate institution and other institutions that they acknowledge the strength of your programs. I will say that, that articulation agreements are based upon the strengths. Um, it's not just, we're going to just articulate with you. We want to see what you're doing. Um, and, and then, you know, they're going to look at you from your partners, your partner schools. Okay. And, and then again, you fulfill everything. So, um, and I wish Tanya was, she's not here. She's the one that handles the New York and the Jefferson because they come out more of the, of the exercise and health science area. Um, but it's not just, you know, Zach applied and you're in. You know, um, it's not just a formality. Um, but I, I will say that um, the New York chiropractic came, there were site visits. Um, they went through the curriculum and really made sure that we are, you know, saying what we say we do. Um, and then it goes from there. So there are strengths in the articulations that for me, it reinforces like the NSF, it puts the reinforcement back into your academic programs. It's recognized from the outside when someone acknowledges they want to or will articulate with you. Um, but they're already demonstrating or supporting that your program is a strong, strong program. I mean, I kind of wish sometimes it was just a, a you know, plug and play, but um, it isn't. Oh, 
Fantastic. Um, so yeah, it looks like that actually wraps up um, our questions and yeah, time-wise I, you know, that was, yeah, we're good. Um, so at this point, no, I, I want to say thank you again to the presenters. That was honestly amazing. Um, so, you know, Dana, Deb, uh, especially Logan and Zach, thank you for taking time out of your, your schedules today to come in and do this. Um, because, you know, from what I saw, I hope, you know, those of you watching, um, it's exactly what came up earlier that, you know, you are going to be supported here. You're going to have somebody to talk to as you go through this process. Um, and, you know, I know those of you who have joined us before for these sessions know, uh, I've said this before, I, you know, visiting in person, learning all this information firsthand and really getting that on campus experience is the best way to get that. But I hope some of that came across today. And, you know, you know that this is a supportive environment that, you know, our entire job is to get you to where you want to be, to help you to succeed in pursuing where it is that, you know, you want to end up after Wilson. Um, and I think some of the success stories you've heard today, of course, um, you know, we love to tout that. We love to talk about what our students are doing. So, you know, if you're coming for this fall, obviously we look forward to seeing you soon. If you're looking even later, um, you know, keep it open. As soon as we can invite students back to campus, we are going to do that. Um, and we will show you exactly what it is that we do and hopefully show you're on campus a little bit too. Um, so again, presenters, thank you. For those of you watching at home, thank you for um, joining us. Uh, you had the email addresses, of course, uh, Dana, Deb, and uh, Tanya, who again, unfortunately, was not able to join us today. Um, you know, reach out with any other questions that you have. That's what we're here for. That's what admissions is here for. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to your admissions counselor as well. So with that said, again, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. I hope you're all safe and ha uh, healthy out there. And, you know, we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks.